Luke chapter 8 this evening, Sunday night through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, chapter 8 of the Gospel according to Luke. We read in verse 1, Now it came to pass afterward that he, that is Jesus, went through uh, every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Uh, the, one of the other gospels teaches that the, uh, the very first words that came out of Jesus' mouth in his uh, beginning of his public ministry was, repent uh, for the kingdom of God is at it, is it hand. And it was the an announcement of the kingdom of God, the announcement of another kingdom. And uh, the announcement of another kingdom, the reality of another kingdom is very, very exciting news for those who have become disillusioned with the kingdoms of man. And you live long enough in this world and you think this is as good as it gets? Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the only kingdom option that we have in life is the kingdom of man, one gigantic mistake after another and learning nothing from history. And Jesus comes on the scene and he makes known the availability of a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And he declared repent because repentance is required in order to enter into that kingdom, to repent of our sin and put our faith in him as our savior and then to enter into that kingdom. But what a wonderful thing it is to be able to announce the, to the world the good tidings, the good news of the kingdom of God. Anybody can become a member of that kingdom in a moment in uh, time. And as he's making this preaching, kind of preaching tour that he's uh, in the middle of, he is uh, accompanied by uh, others. The 12 were with him, that is the 12 apostles. And additionally, certain women who had been healed uh, of uh, evil spirits, also healed of infirmities. And some of these women are named Mary uh, called Magdalene, out of whom came uh, seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, uh, Herod steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him uh, from their uh, substance. And so he's traveling with this much larger group. You remember that when Jesus called the twelve uh, to become his apostles, that he spent a night in prayer before he did so, and he called that twelve from a much larger group of disciples that were uh, following him and traveling with him. So a lot of people traveling with him at this time in his uh, ministry. Very interestingly, uh, uh, Luke brings out the fact that there was among this group, there were also uh, certain women. And he tells us each of them had been impacted in their own way uh, by the life and the teaching of Jesus, by his power. Some had been impacted by his delivering them, as Mary Magdalene was, from seven demons. Imagine uh, what kind of a life or non-life or worse than an existence to be, uh, to be controlled by seven demons inside. And yet Jesus delivered her and brought her uh, into uh, freedom. And then Joanna, who is described as the wife of Chuzza, he's described as Herod's steward. He would have probably been in charge uh, of Herod, uh, the Roman governor at that time in that, that part of, of Israel, in, in charge of his estate, in charge of his pr property. It would have been a very prominent uh, position, and, uh, and he would have been a prominent man and she would have been a, a prominent woman by virtue of, of being his, uh, his uh, wife. And so she is a, has become a, a, a follower of Jesus as well. There's a, um, the, it, 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 there, there is the idea, good day is a, 
a commentator, and uh, he has the uh, idea that maybe this uh, Chuzza and, uh, and the wife of Chuzza here, that she became a follower of Jesus, him as well. Uh, by virtue, as was recorded in John chapter 14, uh, there was a high officer in Capernaum who approached Jesus concerning the healing of his son. Uh, Jesus didn't go to the house. He merely spoke uh, the fact that the, the son would be healed. They returned to the house and found him healed that very hour. And uh, we don't know for certain, but it would uh, certainly make sense that, uh, that it, someone like that could have been impacted in that way, and both husband and wife now becoming a follower of Jesus. It is interesting that here you have Mary Magdalene. Imagine again, as, as much as we can, uh, imagine what her life was reduced to, being demon-possessed by seven demons. I mean, what relationship can you hold on to? Uh, what job can you hold on to? What kind of stability in your life would you have? It would just be uh, a nightmare. You talk about coming uh, into adult life and, and becoming a Christian out of more than the wrong side of the tracks. You're on the wrong side of the tracks spiritually in terms of uh, uh, God and the devil. And then yet here she is a part of a group of women that are traveling now with Jesus. And then we have this wife of a very prominent official in uh, Herod's uh, 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 court. And both of them come together, their lives to come together as a result of a common impact, a common uh, work of Jesus in their lives. And it's one of the wonderful things about being a Christian is just here we are, just one church. How many churches in Modesto? And then how many churches in California in the world? And you see the broad diversity of mankind that is brought together, uh, of, of every kind of human being and background brought together and, and able to live together, get along together, worship God together, because what we have in common in having him as a savior brings us together. And I, I don't know what the relationship was between Mary Magdalene and, and the wife of Chesa in all of this. I'm sure it was a wonderful relationship, as was Susanna. We know nothing more about her than her name as she's listed here. But I think about my own life. Uh, if the Lord hadn't saved me, I wouldn't know one of you. I, wouldn't, I would not have a relationship. I, would, I would never would have spent one minute not with one person in this room or the, 35, uh, the people that I've met in 35 years. And being the pastors, the Lord took me from another city and brought me here. And I think about what a loss my life would be as a result of that. Because this is a funny thing, this thing called church, even in Modesto or wherever it might be, where you have, in any church that you want to go to, every different kind of person comes. And it isn't all professionals, and it isn't all blue collar workers and all white collar workers and all educated to one degree or educated in another. We come together and we interact as a, as a family, as a part of the body of Christ, all of this diversity. I've never met a Christian who walks with the Lord, or maybe doesn't, you know, is it, it's a bump in their life or whatever that I, that I don't learn something from as a Christian. And how rich we are to be a member of the kingdom of God and to be able to, and to, and to partake of what we would only learn by such a broad exposure to mankind that Christ brings our way in a local church and in the body of Christ uh, as, as a whole. And you notice these women, as they're listed here, were also told that there were many others and that they provided for him from their substance. And so uh, one commentator, uh, he declares loose gospel to be the gospel of womanhood. And, uh, and, he, and, he, and he states that 
in part from this snippet that we see here in the gospel according uh, to Luke. But he, he may very well uh, be onto something in, uh, to one degree or another. I mean, you, uh, it's interesting how uh, tenderly and beautifully the gospel according to Luke uh, presents Mary, presents Elizabeth, presents uh, Anna there in the temple when Jesus is brought uh, into that place. Even in chapter 7, as we saw last time, the raising of the only son of the widow of Nain and delivering him back to uh, this woman. Later on in the book, we're going to be uh, impacted and introduced to the sisters of Lazarus, Martha and, and, and Mary, and, and so many women in the Bible that, that uh, impact us by virtue of the record, uh, them being included in the record. Of course, most of the record uh, centers upon men, namely the disciples as they're being prepared to be the leaders of the church. But, the, but women are very, very prominent within the, uh, the, the Gospels and this Gospel as well. And that would have been something that would have been very, very unusual uh, in the ancient world. To allow women to have so prominent and public a play, place in his uh, public ministry uh, would have been unheard of almost in those days. And uh, there are some who surmise, well, the women came along in order to cook and, and sew and this kind of thing. And I don't doubt that that, uh, that may be true on, on some level. But I think it's entirely possible that in the modesty uh, of that ancient Jewish culture, that they became a part of this group that traveled with Jesus uh, to fulfill the, a, a role that we've known or I've known and you've known in our lifetimes for uh, instance in India where women are called, Christian women are called Jesus women and their entire ministry is to go and bring the gospel to women. You would never as a man in India approach a woman on your own. Uh, that, would be, that would be an insult that would get you in terrible trouble. So how do you reach half the population of India? It would take women then going door to door and talking with women on the street in a way that men couldn't. Not all cultures in the world are like uh, American culture. And so I have, I have no doubt that they went forth and they had their place in, in sharing the gospel and, and bringing the word of God and word of his kingdom uh, to women. It wasn't unheard of in the ancient world uh, for women uh, to be financially well off, and we shouldn't be surprised that uh, those who were, uh, or even modestly well off, for their lives to be impacted by Jesus and then desire to take and use those resources toward uh, the support of him and the support of his ministry and the work that he was doing. I mean, every Sunday there's a part of our service where we worship the Lord in our, in our giving, an acknowledgement to him of the fact that everything that we have uh, comes from him, an act of worship. He commands it and we do it. And, uh, but imagine if, uh, if we were denied that privilege, if uh, we had to spend every single, especially if you've got like um, uh, $5 of spare cash uh, above uh, uh, what your needs are, all the way up to having uh, $50 million above what you need. And imagine not being able to spend that on anything but yourself or anything but what is happening in this world, to be denied the ability to be a part of an eternal work financially. Well, of course, this is something that we want to do with our financial resources as well. And these women were no, uh, uh, no, no different. And so uh, here they came and and began to support in this way. I do think whenever I see what, uh, how uh, Jesus' treatment of women 
um, how they were esteemed so contrary to the culture, not in a modesty way in any way, but in a way that um, viewed them very differently from how the, the majority of the culture, both in Roman culture, but certainly in Jewish culture in, in those days. And today, of course, in the Western world, uh, Christianity is attacked and often attacked uh, by women as the, the source of some kind of awful bondage toward women uh, for one sole reason, and that is uh, if a woman is going to marry a man, she is to submit to his authority when push comes to shove in decision-making within a marriage. And a husband is to love his, uh, uh, his, his wife as the church. The, the lone command that is given uh, to each of them. And you would think that that being in the Bible was be like the end of the world uh, for someone. But just take a moment and think about this. Think about how Jesus' encounter with every woman in the Bible, how he elevated her experience and, exper and elevated her life. And look around anywhere you want in the world where there has been a dynamic, deep, living impact of the gospel in that nation or that part of the world, and then look at the parts of the world where the gospel has never effectively uh, 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 been able to take hold within it in the form of a, a, of a revival. And you look at both of those groups and watch how they treat women. And so here we are in this Western culture in the United States of America, built upon a Judeo-Christian ethic, built upon the truth of the Bible, built upon every person being created in the image of God, fashions our thinking about how we view both men and women, people, all people, all of these uh, kind of things, and women have been able to uh, rise in a lot of different ways within the culture that is unheard of in the rest of, of the world. And now, uh, today, and it's getting nothing uh, but worse, with this attack against Christianity is this great enemy. But I would contend that if you want to do away with Christianity in the United States of America and in the world, because God demands uh, a particular role in the, in the marriage uh, relationship, and you want to abandon the Bible and what it, teach, it teaches about how we're to view uh, one another, and you want this to go back to the savages? You want this to go back to might makes right? You don't want men to be dominated by the Word of God, a love for God, a teaching from the Word of God about how to treat all people, including women. You want it to go back to sheer strength and see what in a generation it can become again in even a nation like this. No one is a true feminist who is, and is certainly not a true feminist or concerned for women or knows anything about the Bible or human history that attacks the Bible or attacks Christ or Christianity as any kind of obstacle, much less an enemy to women. He elevated every woman's life that he came into contact with as he does with everyone. It is the worst thing in the world uh, the, the success of what is well underway within our culture if they uh, were ever to be successful. Jesus then moves on and, and, uh, and we're told in verse 4, and when a great multitude had gathered, so uh, here he is traveling, he is very, very popular, everywhere he's teaching great crowds are, are forming, and a great multitude does as well, and they came to him from every city. And so he spoke to them uh, in a parable. And so they've come gathered to hear, and the parable that he delivers to them, as we'll see in a moment, is the parable uh, of the soils. And this parable is found in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke. And this particular point in the teaching of this parable in each of those gospels, it represents a turning point 
in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus has become a very, very popular uh, teacher. And all he has to do is begin to open up his mouth and the crowds are immense all, uh, all around him. But the makeup of the crowd is changing at this point. And so you have people that are coming to listen to him just out of curiosity. He's a sideshow. It's the circus or the carnival coming into town. There was a large section of the groups that would come to hear him, like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came uh, only to listen to find uh, fault with, uh, uh, with him. And so he begins now to teach in parables, knowing that those who uh, make a par up the great crowd that are eager to understand his truth will search out, make the effort to, and, and show the sincerity of wanting to really learn from him spiritually by seeking out the meaning of the parable or the word picture that he provides to them. And then the casual seekers or, or worse, the hostile uh, people that made up the, con the, the, the crowd would, uh, would uh, gain uh, nothing uh, from them. And so he, he introduces now this parabolic kind of, of ministry. And, and in doing so, he's kind of separating uh, the men from the boys, the sincere from the insincere. And uh, Jesus is clearly in doing this, very, very interested in the quality of the spiritual hunger in his people and in his disciples. He could have had uh, gigantic crowds and said, look at the size of these crowds. And he didn't care about the size of the crowds. What he cared about was the truth that he was delivering. And then having those truths be opened up to people who really wanted them uh, to know those truths. And as we'll see in a, in a moment, the parables were written uh, to illuminate spiritual truth for people, but at the same time uh, to hide spiritual truth from people who were hostile or had a different kind of mindset. The parable that he lays out, a famous one, is a simple one. Uh, everyone would have understood it. And uh, a parable, uh, the, the word parable is made up of uh, two words, para alongside, uh, and then a bull in the, uh, to throw, a uh, balos. So it means to throw alongside. And the parable is simply Jesus taking an image from everyday life that they all understood. A physical image, we understand that. And then throwing that alongside a spiritual truth that they didn't understand or needed a little help understanding. And then by uh, understanding the part that they did understand, the, th the thing from life, carrying it over to the spiritual, they would have the aha moment and realize the spiritual truth that Jesus was, was trying to reveal to them. And so he, uh, the parable is one where you have a sower that went out to sow seed. This went on uh, everywhere in an agrarian society uh, at that time. And the seed was uh, broadcast, where they just would have maybe a sack of seed, take a fistful of it, and they would just cast it, uh, uh, not rows, putting in a, a bean every uh, 12 inches or something like that. They're broadcasting the seed, is the, the sowing that's going on. And a, as the sower, he sowed, uh, some of the seed fell by uh, the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air uh, then quickly devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Then some of the seed fell additionally upon thorns, and the thorns sprang up uh, with the seed, and they choked it out. They, they took all of the light. They took all of the, the resources uh, in, in competing uh, f with the, the good seed for its health and strength. But others fell on good ground. And that seed sprang up and it yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now everyone has ears, uh, but not everyone has ears to hear. And the same thing is not only true in life concerning any particular subject, the same thing is true um, surrounding spiritual things. Everybody has ears, 
But not everyone comes to Jesus, not everyone comes to God's Word with ears to hear and an eagerness to hear what it is that God has to say. And when Jesus speaks here and He says, he who has ears to hear, uh, ears to hear, let him hear, He is basically saying to the crowd, listen up, I have just said something very, very important uh, to you. Well, the disciples, they listen to the parable, and this teaching in parables is new to them at this particular point in time. And they asked him, saying, uh, what does uh, the parable uh, mean? And so they, uh, the, the, they were confused by the meaning of it. And Jesus said, to, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, how the kingdom of God operates versus the kingdom of man. But to the rest, it's given in parables that seeing they may not see and hearing they may uh, not hear. And so Jesus said the, the reason for the parables was twofold was to further reveal spiritual truth to his disciples, those who were hungry to, to know the meaning of spiritual things and, and uh, willing to listen to what he had to say. A parable like this would immediately grab people's uh, attentions. And uh, it's just kind of like if a, uh, a Bible teacher is, uh, mentions a movie or a cartoon or a, uh, some kind of a, I was in the shopping, I was in line at a store and then this and this, and everybody perks up. Everybody likes a story like that. And, uh, and, and so it would get the attention of the honest uh, seeker and then who would then search out the meaning of the parable. But he said the parables, again, had the, uh, a second uh, purpose was to hide the, uh, his truth from those who uh, give the appearance of being a sincere seeker, but, but they're nothing uh, of, of uh, the, uh, the sort, and uh, just coming to find fault with him. And again, the Jewish religious leaders were this kind of person. And so a parable uh, reveals uh, to a certain kind of person, and it conceals uh, uh, to another uh, kind of person based solely upon the condition uh, of the heart uh, of, of the hearer. And uh, the person who's interested in the truth, they're going to learn something not interested. They're, they're not uh, going to learn anything. I think that to hear the Word of God in whatever form it is, it is uh, not only a great privilege, but it is a great responsibility. So when you pick up a Bible, or somebody begins to teach the Bible, or you hear it on the radio, or you've downloaded a teaching on uh, your device of some kind, and to be able to hear the Word of God is the, the, the most indescribable privilege in life. We're hearing the mind of God, the will of God for our lives. What compares with that uh, in, in this world? A tremendous, tremendous privilege. And, uh, and in, in, a, in a culture like ours, in a country like ours, where there is still even in its ebbing spiritual influence of, of Christianity, uh, the, there is still broad exposure to the Bible and to Christianity. And so people become very, very indifferent, uh, indifferent to it. And, and they don't realize that to hear the Word of God is a privilege, but it's also a responsibility. It's a res each of us has a responsibility to receive it for what it is, the, wor uh, uh, the Word of God, and then to seek out the meaning of it, uh, what it is that God is saying there and how it applies uh, to uh, our lives. And so uh, the, the importance of having this kind of area, uh, 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 this kind of attitude toward the Word of God, to treat it with indifference is, is, is just awful. You think about every area in life has a, mean, uh, a means of uh, separating uh, the casual participant uh, from the sincere uh, participant, whether it, it is in sports or whether it's in academic or in the workplace, and uh, why shouldn't God uh, expect a zeal and a desire among His disciples for the Word of God? This isn't just a conversation that we're having with one another. This isn't just talk radio or sports radio. This is God speaking. 
And uh, Jesus was not going to cast the pearls before swine in the sense that that those that, that didn't want to listen to it or to esteem it in that way. And so when he says, seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand, he is quoting from Isaiah and the attitude of the ancient children of Israel uh, toward the Word of God. And so this, all of this where Jesus is talking about the Word of God, the parables, but the Word of God as a whole, opening up to the sincere seeker, and he will make sure that it does, and that it will not illuminate itself to the indifferent uh, speaker or the person that has to be pumped up to try and uh, listen to God and His Word for, for five minutes. And this separation that Jesus spoke about here didn't just occur 2,000 years ago. It occurs even today. Everywhere God's Word is taught, whether in the form of a parable or not, it demands something to learn the Word of God. And, you know, sometimes I'll see uh, on, a, on Sunday mornings, um, I, I, uh, I, I, when I worked for the phone company and the, uh, so many years ago, and it was back when they, you didn't have answering machines, they'd call you out in the middle of the night, somebody hit a pole and it's raining and it's 32 degrees out there and, and all or whatever, and you'd go spend the night out there or a cable would go out in Oakland or whatever underground and you'd be days working on getting that put together. And then you come to church and the spirit is willing, but the body's weak, man, it's, it's tired. And so people will nod off and all of that, and I get that. And then, but sometimes you see people and in five minutes they're impatient with the whole thing. I don't know what they expected when they came, when you start teaching the Word. I'm talking literally five minutes. They're waiting for the, the, the dancing poodles to come out or to show a cartoon or some kind of, of a whatever. But if you, if you take and you dumb down the Word of God to the culture, and, and unnecessarily where we say, I'm not going to demand anything of the seeker or of the listener. It is not only does a disservice to that individual, but it's an affront in terms of the Word of God. It, it gives people an attitude toward the Word of God that they must not carry over from all of the other uh, attitudes toward everything else in life and put it on this. It's a privilege to hear the Word of God and to search it out. And, and to know it. And so here is the parable is given. Jesus then gives the interpretation of the parable. And he said, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Okay. God wants everybody to hear his word. He wants everybody uh, to hear the gospel, the invitation to become a part of the kingdom of God. The fact that there is a kingdom of God that exists that they can be a part of. And there's going to be four different kinds of soils here, and they, and they represent four different kind of hearers of the Word of God. But the sower, uh, the seed is the Word of God. The sower is whoever is carrying that gospel and that truth, and it is to be strewn, strewn out uh, so that everybody can hear it. Everybody has a right to hear the gospel. What they do with it after that is entirely up to them. But our responsibility is that they would hear the gospel. And so he said, the seed is the word of God. And those by the wayside uh, uh, are the ones who hear the word of God, and then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So, you know, I mean, the, Israel is in Kansas where you've got these fields of grain that go on for miles and miles and miles, and the farms and the ranches are massive. Uh, in Israel, different families would own these smaller plots of land, and uh, you would own this plot, they would own this plot. There wasn't like a four, uh, uh, there wasn't a Pellendale Avenue uh, between them. There would be a path that, that the workers and the owners would walk on between uh, the different fields in order to get to their field and work. And of course, that path, that soil would become compacted, and so the seed would simply sit on top of the soil and then 
in the imagery, everybody recognized the birds would quickly make, make quick work of it and come and, and eat, uh, uh, eat that seed as it's just left sitting uh, on the top uh, of, of the surface. And so this speaks of the hearer uh, to God's Word whose heart is hardened toward the gospel or hardened toward uh, the, the Word of God. And so they hear the Word of God, but they're determined uh, not to let it penetrate or remain uh, in their heart, not to give it any kind of a place where it's going to change my life or impress, uh, make a, a, a permanent impression uh, in, in my life. And so they're, they're absolutely closed uh, to it. And so uh, the, the, the bird com comes along, the bird is represented by the devil and demons, and they come and will pluck the seed out. And so often this kind of person will look and say, uh, you know, listen, I don't have anything to do with, with the gospel, and never has meant anything to me, it's never uh, impacted my life in any way. And so often the idea is that I'm too smart for that, I'm too intellectual for that, I'm too scientific for that or whatever it might be, and they don't know that what has happened is they've been sucker punched by the devil. They heard the gospel. They were not willing to give it that an, an honest hearing and, a, and an a, a honest place in their life, and the devil is very happy to come in and just simply uh, remove the seed. And, and, but, but in verse 13, but the, the ones on the rock, are those that seed, uh, when they hear, receive the Word of God initially with joy, but they have no root, uh, and they believe for a while, and then in a time of, of temptation, they fall away. So this is the emotional here of, of God's Word or of the gospel. So in those days, um, maybe you have something like this, maybe in your lifetime that you've run into, but Israel's a very, very rocky place. And, uh, and, and so when they farm, I mean, they farm up all kinds of rocks. So you would sow seed, and there would be maybe two or three, four inches of soil on top, but right underneath it would be a, a layer of rock. And so the seed would be sown, uh, the, water, the rains would come, the sun would beat upon it, and then because the rock was under, underneath it, and it would then absorb that heat, that seed would germinate more quickly than the rest of the seed. It would be like, wow, this is massive. This guy's going like gangbusters for the Lord. And, uh, but because the, sea, the soil is so uh, uh, shallow that as soon as difficulty or trials represented by a beating sun comes, uh, then all of it just uh, withers away. And there is that kind of a, uh, here, the emotional here, but they don't really give the gospel any uh, kind of depth in their life. And that gets revealed over a period of time. It looks like a lot for a while, and then it doesn't. In, in the old days, not that long ago, but you had um, most Bible teachers, uh, Harry Ironside would be one of them, and evangelists uh, would be in the earlier part of the, the um, 20th century, the 1900s, that when they would talk about, they wouldn't talk about people becoming Christians in their meeting. They wouldn't say, this many people became Christians. They would always say, this many people professed a faith in Christ. For this very reason, because they were in essence saying, we won't know until the trials and the difficulties and the temptations come in their life and that they continue on through that, whether something real happened between them and God or whether it was just something emotion and surface level. And then there's that, that third soil, that third kind of heart, and the, the ones where that seed uh, fell uh, among the thorns. And those are those that when they've heard the word of God, they've heard the gospel, uh, they go out and that, that gospel, that word of God gets choked with cares, riches, and the pleasures of life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. So here's, here's a person who believes the Bible, absolutely believes the Bible. 
uh, believes in the gospel, 100% believes in, in the gospel, and yet all of their resources, all of their nutrition, all of their everything related to their life does not go into their relationship with the Lord, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, and ultimately those things crowd out uh, the things of God in their life, and they never become fruitful. Uh, for God. And this speaks of the crowded heart. This is one of the, certainly one you want to, we would want to pay attention with in a materialistic culture like, like our own. And, uh, and uh, where so many things are competing with this work of God in our lives. And then, uh, but uh, th- there is good news here in verse 15, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, uh, and, uh, and again, it's the soil represents a heart, uh, they keep it and they bear fruit with pers- uh, patience or with perseverance. And so they, they receive it, they're excited, their heart is, they come to listen to Jesus' teaching, read it in the Bible. They're hungry for everything that he might say. The word has found a rich place in their lives, and there is going to be all kinds of spiritual fruit in their lives as, as a result uh, of that. And so here's the four basic, as Jesus lays it out, basic kind of hearts that are represented in any crowd that is associated with him. Uh, and, and even any church, probably not in the same proportions, but anywhere the seed is sown, anywhere you have an evangelistic campaign, anywhere that you go out and you uh, um, evangelize or share the gospel, these are the four kind of hearts in, in, in general, kind of people that you're going to uh, run into. And it's important to understand from this, uh, what is being laid out here, is how a person responds to the gospel in response to the Word of God, uh, uh, that is no reflection upon the seed. It is no reflection upon the truth of God. Uh, uh, What I do with the Word of God is no reflection upon God at all or His truth. It is solely a reflection on me and what I esteem to be valuable in life or how smart or dumb I am to either accept or reject uh, God's offer. It's always uh, a reflection of the condition of our own heart. And so it's good to ask ourselves. And it's one thing to read the Bible and to study a parable like this and, and put ourselves in the, sho- in the shoes of those he spoke to, go back in some kind of a time machine within our mind 2,000 years ago and picture that crowd there. But it's the same message to us today. And Jesus speaks to every crowd, every group, speaks right into this room and basically says every single one of us is one of those four soils. Every one of us is bringing one of those four hearts to his word and to his truth and to his gospel. And then it's up to us to look at uh, in the privacy of our own heart um, to see where we land related to the parable. It, ha- it, ha- it, it is as powerful an application to any assembly of people around the name of Jesus Christ today as ever it was 2,000 years ago and for exactly the same reasons, to separate the men from the boys, so to speak, the serious from uh, the unserious, and the promise that he would open things up to those who were serious about learning from him. Then he moves on into what is known as the parable of the lamp. And, uh, and he said, no one, when he has lit a lamp, uh, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but he sets it upon a lampstand that those who might enter might see the light. Because we've, uh, living as we live today, even the, you see so many houses today where they're, the new ones that are being built, they're indoor, outdoor, right? So the outdoor comes into the indoor, lots of glass. You see buildings go up in major cities that they are 100% glass from top to bottom. Uh, that is a luxury of this generation. Uh, to how we've been able to harness uh, fuel in order to heat these buildings and uh, to do so relatively inexpensively. 
Uh, if, the, if fuel busts, uh, you aren't going to want a glass house because you aren't going to be able to keep it warm. There was a reason back in the Middle Ages that uh, windows were this big. It was to keep the heat in the house so you wouldn't freeze to death. And so light, though, has always been uh, something that is valuable, certainly in the ancient world. Today we go in, turn on the lights and turn on everything in the whole house. Now we can set the whole thing uh, in computer. Everything's lit up as much as, as we want and as much as we can afford to pay uh, the bill. But in those days, a light, once that sun went down, I mean, the street lights didn't come on for a while. Well, there were no street lights. So you, everything was pitch dark, depending upon the, the stage of the moon. So they would take these oil lamps. There's a little thing you could put in your hand, put all of the oil in a, in a wick, and you're going to try and light an entire room with it. Well, you're not going to put that on the floor. You're not going to put that under a bed or under a basket or anywhere. You're going to find a, a lampstand. You're going to have a, a little kind of ledge on the wall that you put it on to maximize the light. And that's the image that Jesus uh, speaks here about, uh, uh, about uh, how you handle light. He said, for nothing, is secret, uh, for nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear, for whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken uh, away from him. And the, and the whole idea here it, that Jesus is laying out in terms of the imagery of this particular parable is that the lamp here represents the truth that he has imparted to his disciples. Uh, the truth of the parable of the sower, and other truth as well, and uh, the secrets of the kingdom of God. And these truths for us as Christians are not to be put under a basket. They're not to be hidden in our home, but we are to make these truths known to the world around us. And that's what it is that uh, he is communicating, putting them out where everyone can uh, see them. And he lays the principle out there in verses 17 and 18. If a person accepts Jesus' truth uh, concerning the gospel, then more spiritual revelation will occur. The Bible will instantly begin to open itself up uh, to that person. But if a person rejects the gospel and, and not only uh, doesn't receive, do they not receive a greater revelation uh, of the Word of God, it will remain a closed book, but the day will come uh, when even the opportunity to receive the gospel will be lost. And that will be lost at the moment of it, it, it death. And I think about how I looked at the Bible before I became a Christian and committed my life to the Lord. That was a closed book for me. And I had a friend that was a, a friend of, my, uh, of the family that knew my mother. Her name was Dorothy Culbertson. God bless her. You'll see her. She'll be in one of the two front rows in heaven. This woman witnessed to everyone and she witnessed to my stepfather every single time she saw him. And uh, he didn't particularly care for it, but he did become a Christian on his deathbed, and I think in large part because of what he saw in, in, uh, her, uh, in her life. And, and, uh, she, and the, the, I've lost track of where, where I was going to go uh, with all of, oh, the Bible being closed to me. I would go on these, these uh, road trips playing basketball in junior college, and we'd go to all these different places, and we'd be given a certain amount of money to eat on the, on the trip and everything. And, and so there wasn't money really for movies or buying whatever to read or anything like that. So there was always a Gideon Bible in the, in the drawer, if, uh, I mean, if push came to shove. And... Um, <clears throat> And so I'd pick that up, I'd read it, Dorothy would tell me, read the book of Proverbs, you know, and, and I'd read it. And then one day you get born again. And all of a sudden, this, all of this a hunger for the Word of God, all of it starts to fall into place. And it's exactly what Jesus is uh, laying out here. And it's so important to notice it's just a single word there in verse 18, where he says, therefore take heed uh, how you hear. That's the point he's making to the, to the audience that's there. Of course, we always have to take heed to 
what we hear. And we're, and we're relatively careful about that as Christians. We guard what it is that we allow into our minds and into our hearts by virtue of hearing. But just guarding what we hear isn't enough. Jesus says we are to take heed to how we hear, speaking about His Word. Again, the attitude that we bring to the Word of God when we come to study it and when we come to read it. Because if how we hear isn't right, then it won't open up to us in the way that it would uh, if our heart uh, was right in, in coming uh, to it. And then uh, uh, Jesus is, this huge crowds are around him, he's busy as can be. Then his mother and his brothers, they uh, came to him. And we know from one of the other gospels that Mary and his brothers came because they were concerned for his health. Uh, there's so many people. He's ministering to people from uh, the, the first moment in the morning all the way through to the end of the day, teaching, healing, all of these things going on. And they're concerned that, uh, remember, the brothers don't believe that he's the Messiah or the Son of God yet. Mary knows. And, uh, but they're concerned for his health, want to take him away so that he doesn't get burned out with the kind of pace that, he's, uh, that he's, he's keeping. They have no idea that his ministry was going to be a very short three and a half years and then be done at the age of 33 and a half years old. And they're thinking about, you know, pace yourself. Life is uh, a long time. And so they, they came to him with that idea of trying to rescue him a little bit. And they couldn't approach him be, just because of the, the sheer size of the crowd. And somebody came from the outside and, and told him, uh, informed him that your mother and your brothers are standing outside. Uh, they can't get in to see you and they're, they're desiring to see you. And uh, Jesus answered and he said to them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and uh, do it. And so Jesus said the person who becomes one of his disciples uh, marked by hearing the word of God, by doing the word uh, uh, of, of God enters into a relationship with him that is far deeper than any relationship can be when it is merely a human uh, 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 relationship. Uh, even the strongest, what happens in a relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, that is a relationship that becomes stronger and greater in our lives than even the strongest family relationship, no matter how wonderful the family relationship uh, might be. And so uh, Jesus uh, responds in this way. He doesn't disown his mother. He doesn't disown his family. When he is going to be crucified, in a short period of time, he's hanging on the cross. He looks down. There is uh, the Apostle John and Mary, and he commends Mary into the care of the Apostle John for the remainder of uh, his, uh, her life. And so he cares about his, his family, and, but at this point, his life was being uh, given completely to those who were eager to hear the Word of God and uh, eager to obey it. Now, uh, this passage it clears, up, uh, it clears up a couple of things for us in, in terms of some teaching concerning Mary that goes on uh, in the name of, of Christianity. It is important to realize that Mary uh, was not a perpetual virgin, as the Roman Catholic uh, Church teaches. You notice that she comes with Jesus' brothers. Uh, they are his half-brothers. After Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary engaged in normal sexual relationship of a husband and wife, and sons were uh, the product of that particular union. And so they were his step-brothers uh, based upon uh, 
uh, that the, uh, based upon the relationship with sharing the same mother in, in Mary, but no perpetual uh, virginity as is laid here. Now the Roman Catholic Church will try and uh, lay out the fact that the word can speak about you know, other family relationships that are more distant and this kind of thing, but clearly that, that's not what Luke is talking about here. He's talking about immediate family. He did have brothers later on we're going to see that his brothers uh, didn't believe right up to the moment that he was crucified. And then yet after his resurrection, uh, became believers uh, in him. You notice too that she really didn't, uh, doesn't have any place of privilege in terms of access to him. Uh, again, in Roman Catholicism, I'm not trying to unduly pick on them, but I'm not going to be a coward about it either. And uh, we need to understand these things about w what is right and what is true uh, in, in the worship of Him. And so often Mary is presented as the one that you take your prayers to within Roman Catholicism, that you should never think that you can take your prayers straight to Jesus or straight to God. How could we f consider ourselves to be worthy of that? And after all, He might say no. And if we want something really bad enough, then who better to send to a son than his mother to talk him into the thing that we want. And yet we see that she is given no privilege in terms of access uh, to him, and he even refuses uh, to cease being engaged in what he was engaged in uh, here uh, to bring her in and give her not only the request of someone else to bring uh, to him, but even her own request uh, to bring uh, to him. And so uh, she certainly isn't, as some sects within Roman Catholicism teach, that uh, as a co-redemptress, if she was, Jesus would have never spoken of her uh, in this way and he would have directed people to her as the means of uh, getting things done in heaven, and yet none of that happens here. And the point, uh, and it's a necessary point of the passage, is the, it is a point that makes the very point that is contrary to the teaching of Roman Catholicism related to Mary. And, and the point is, don't have confidence in Mary. I mean, it just fairly jumps off of the page. Don't have confidence in uh, Mary, but rather have confidence in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that is marked by an obedient life. And that is the one who comes into an intimacy with God where we don't need any other mediators or go-betweens between us and Him in that uh, relationship. We can go to Him and approach God, and, and His throne has been made into a throne of grace from which He dispenses grace and mercy into our lives. There are no layers like that. We're called to boldly come before the throne of God based upon our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so these are the things that were encumbering Christianity, complicating Christianity, um, misrepresenting God 2,000 years ago, and there is much of that same thing that is going on even today. And this is all about a personal relationship with God, individually, us. And, and then walking obediently in that relationship. And there is no higher or greater Christianity or access to God or relationship with God than the one that is found there. It is the highest and most wonderful relationship anyone can know in life. And we'll stop there tonight and pick it up in verse um, 19 uh, next time. Let's stand together now as we close. If you stand here this evening and you are not yet a Christian, we'll be up in front immediately after the service, pastors and others, and we'd love to pray with you to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today. He's the one you've been looking for all of your life. And uh, when he comes in, it's just like everything clicks and makes sense. I'm not saying it's the easiest life in the world. It isn't. 
uh, but it is true, and it is the greatest life that a person uh, can live. If you have any needs in your life tonight that you'd like somebody to pray with you over, uh, we'd love to pray with you as well. Let's pray now. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ and what we've looked at tonight. And thank you for the diversity of the body. Thank you for how different all of us are and how wonderful it is that you bring us together and what we learn from one another, the unique, uh, uh, incomparable thing that your kingdom is in this world. And we thank you for the privilege uh, of being a part of it. And we pray, Lord, that none of us would leave here tonight uh, where our heart and our attitude, our receptivity to you and your truth is anything other than that fourth soil of being willing to receive it as it is due to be received as the very Word of God and to be planted into a heart that is eager for it to find root and to Im impact our lives. Thank you for this time of worship tonight in song, this time in your word, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.